the psalmist confesses, oh my God, in you I trust. I do not trust the ability of Sydney infrastructure and public transportation to withstand more than a light shower. I do not trust the guy that I let merge in front of me to give me my well-deserved courtesy wave. I do not trust that I can stay dry when bathing a toddler. I do not trust the market to achieve justice or equality. I do not trust pollsters predicting elections, especially when they're in my favour. I do not trust the promises of politicians that they will take substantive action to address our climate emergency. I do not trust that hard-won civil rights victories cannot be undone. I do not trust the governing bodies of colonial Australia to ever properly recognise the sovereignty of the Indigenous peoples of the land. I do not trust that society is on some inevitable march to progress. I might have hope for these things, and on my better days I may work for these things, but they are not something I feel comfortable placing any ultimate hope in or trust in. For as Fleming Rutledge writes, Advent begins with the recognition that human progress is a deception. Oh my God, in you I trust. This is the posture of the Christian at Advent placing our hope and trust in the future of God, trusting that God who became incarnate keeps promises and will make right all that is wrong. Welcome to the second annual Love, Rinse, Repeat Advent Special Spectacular. Uh, my name is Liam Miller and joining me today to discuss many things Advent is the Reverend Canon Dr. Kara N. Slade. Kara is Adjunct Professor of Theology at Princeton Theological Seminary, she serves as Associate Rector at Trinity Church, Associate Chaplain of the Episcopal Church at Princeton, and Canon Theologian of the Diocese of New Jersey. Please welcome her to Love, Rinse, Repeat, and welcome again to the second annual Love, Rinse, Repeat Advent Special Spectacular. I think the name will stick. Well, Cara, welcome to Love, Rinse, Repeat. Well, so great to be with you, Liam, and so great to be with, with all of your listeners. That's excellent. Well, we're, we're actually toward the end of Advent. Uh, this is going to come out right on the, in the last few weeks. So I guess I can ask, how has your, your Advent season been so far? Well, it's, it's, been, it's been really good. Um, we have, um, we've had a lot of Advent events um, at the parish. Um, and then, we're, of course, we're getting ready for, for Christmas Eve next week. And um, so that's, I mean, it's a really exciting time um, in the life of the church. I always feel like, um, it's never as reflective a time as I wish for it to be. Um, I think that's a, a common experience for everyone. Um, <laughs> but still, you know, I try to try to sort of fit some fit some extra time for for reading and and for for prayer in the season. Um, but uh, of course, um, between um, social things and church work, it does get busy. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. And maybe we'll talk a bit about that, how we yeah. hold these things together in our world. Uh, this is another kind of warming up question. This mm -hmm. is normally at this time of year, I might ask someone what's their favorite Christmas movie. But uh, okay. and you can and you can answer that one. But also, since Advent is the topic, I guess the question is, is there a favorite Advent movie or, or even are there Advent movies? Uh, oh, goodness so gracious. <laughs> um, I'll have to think about the Advent movie thing, but I, I will um, I will wade into controversy um, and say that my favorite Christmas movie is the original Die Hard. Um, <laughs> I do believe that Die Hard is a Christmas movie, um, and it is it is a habit of mine to watch it every year. Um, and uh, you know, it's almost it doesn't feel like Christmas tide without without mm. a, a watching of of Die Hard. Um, I think Advent is a little bit um, more tricky to, um, to put into, um, put into, you know, movie terms. Um, you know, I think that one, um, one maybe that, that comes to mind right now um, is uh, To the Wonder, the Terrence Malick um, movie, which is, um, you know, at once it um, it shows so much of the um, the brokenness of the world, the presence of sin in the world, and yet also um, gestures towards the possibilities of Christ among us mm. um, towards the end of the film. And I mean, it's a very Kierkegaardian movie. It's um, it's almost like a, a film of works of love in some ways. <laughs> but um, 
but that's that can be kind of a um, an advent movie, although it's certainly not a fun, <laughs> fun movie to watch. No, um, but that, that's one that comes to mind. Yeah, no, that's great because uh, that's hilarious because I was thinking as I asked you the question, I was like, oh, what would I answer this yeah, for? Yeah. And, and, it, and it started to be like, maybe to the wonder. And then you just said it. And yeah. I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, the um, the scene in the in the film where the priest is is going around and you hear that, you know, the St. Patrick's breastplate, Christ within me, mm. Christ before me, Christ beside me. Um, and I mean, that's really, um, you know, really sort of points towards what, um, what it means in the incarnation that, that the infinite enters into the finite, right? That mm. the word is made flesh. Mm. So let's just, let's now go into Advent proper here. So uh, one of the questions that someone posed when I asked for questions on Twitter was my friend, Adrian Jackson, who asked, you know, what is, I guess, the pitch for Advent for low church folks who don't necessarily follow the calendar year because i want to assume there's a decent few of them who listen uh, who may have skipped over this episode entirely because of the title yeah. or maybe go you know what i'll give it a go i'll see uh if you're not someone who generally observes the the church count the lecture calendar church calendar mm -hmm. lower church kind of engagement what's what's to be gained from observing advent or from paying attention to this yes yeah, so um i'm gonna answer this question a little bit obliquely and that's to say um First of all, um, I think it can be tricky for, and this, this question comes up, I think um, it's come up quite a bit um, when I was working at Duke Divinity School um, with Lent. You had uh, evangelicals um, really thinking about, well, is Lent something that makes sense for, for us to observe? Um, but they would just take out that season, right? Um, and so I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to say, um, yes, uh, folks who are in a low church tradition should think twice, you know, to think more about observing Advent if you're not doing the rest of the liturgical year, okay, because um, I would never want people to sort of pick out Advent or pick out Lent, especially as the two really penitential times of the year, without knowing that, you know, Christmas tide is 12 days. Um, Easter is 50 days, right? The season of Easter. And so all of these sort of times of expectation and repentance and um, looking inside ourselves, looking at our world and seeing how, um, how many things we long to be redeemed is balanced by um, seasons of joy and feasting. So I think the question that I would like for low church folks to ask themselves in their congregations is, what would it mean for our church to observe the liturgical year in total? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Cause I don't, you know, I would rather not have folks take, take one season out. Um, but to say what, what would, what, what would happen um, if we started thinking about time liturgically? And the question that, um, that sort of feeds into that one is um, start thinking about how you, what is your default assumption for what your your existence in time is right hey i just happened to have written a book about this coming soon but um but in the modern west um in the modern west what are our default assumptions about the way that time works in our lives um, often we assume that time exists we're on a linear trajectory up um, you know, every day and every way we're getting better and better, right? We assume that technological progress and moral progress are somehow related and that we're all sort of working, we're growing towards the kingdom of God. Here we go, up and up and up. Um, but really, um, if you look at, and you, you'll see um, uh, folks like uh, Steven Pinker with his book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, really kind of bending over backwards to try to prove that people are becoming less violent as, as history goes forward and that human history really is a, a moving staircase, right? That's, that's all um, drawing us upwards. But I, I you know, um, Steven Pinker really has to look past the history of the 20th century to, to, to make any kind of argument that that's true. Um, you know, whatever optimism, might have been 
um, common even among Christians at the turn of the 20th century, I think was comprehensively uh, dashed by the end of the century. And so um, a thing that the liturgical year can do for Christians is to sort of disrupt those assumptions of progress and to really bring us back around and around and around again each year to the knowledge that we need Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior um, every year on Good Friday, just as much as we did last year. So um, not that that fixes anything politically or socially, um, but that it can be a kind of a corrective, right? Um, it, can, it can be another way of, of living in the world. You know, um, my former colleague, Lauren Winner um, at Duke once said that she, knew, she would know um, that she was truly converted to Jesus Christ when the liturgical calendar governed her time more than the academic calendar, right? And so it's always a question, you know, what calendar governs your time? What assumptions about time and human history lurk beneath the surface of, of, of the way you are in the world, of the way your church is in the world? So that's a pitch for why um, the liturgical year is important for all Christians, mm. but also to say, um, let's not pull out one part of it because it can, um, it can kind of distort. Things. Yeah. Thank you for that. And um, I want to I keep with this idea of, you know, disrupting the idea of uh, progress and, and history as, as a, a march of progress, because I guess one of the best things to happen uh, for Advent in, in recent time was that Fleming Rutledge published a book of sermons about it last year. Yeah. And, and she, she has a quote that, you know, um, Advent begins with the acknowledgement that human progress is a deception. Uh, so we've started to kind of already kind of, um, express some of your theological feelings about progress uh, yeah. as this kind of march. Um, so I guess why, how is it that Advent, do, you know, itself um, as one of the seasons disrupts this concept of progress? And, and why is that an important posture to take going into Advent? Why is that an important place to start? Yeah, um, let's see, let me say a couple of things about this. Um, you know, another thing that uh, Fleming Rutledge says, and I, I'm I'm so grateful to her um, for her ministry within the Episcopal Church, and I think also for her for her friendship. She's been a great support for me. Um, you know, she has a, a sermon where she talks about how um, how can I love the dreadful day of judgment. She talks that about the in harking back to the 1928 prayer book, um, the dreadful day of judgment when the secrets of all hearts will be revealed. Um, and so there's a sense in which Advent is looking, is looking forward to um, sort of the ultimate truth telling, right? Um, the apocalypse as the showing of everything for what it is. And I think that, um, you know, we live in, in a cloud of, um, of not seeing things rightly. Right. I mean, I'm a I'm a really I'm a good pessimistic reformed person. I, um, you know, our vision is clouded. Our vision is clouded. And so, um, you know, we can see things as, oh, well, you know, we think that things are getting better or we want to see things a certain way. We desire things to be a certain way. And yet Advent is a time for really um, hoping for clearer sight. I mean, obviously, um, eschatologically, that's the ultimate clear sight, right? To see things uh, face to face as we now see dimly. But I think um, now Advent is a time to, um, you know, even as we live in the meantime, to, to try to look more clearly at things as they are and to name things as they are. And that has to do um, with with our our fallenness with our sin as individuals but it's also a time to look at um, the things around us that are also um, that also grown grown for the coming of the new creation right as as paul says um and and in that i think it's it's a little bit different from lent right i i always argue that advent is also a penitential season but it you know, Lent is is a season really for individual individual repentance, right? What is it in my life that um, 
that needs God to, God to act on? Um, what do I need to be truthful about myself? Um, Advent is a little bit different. There's a cosmic undertone to Advent to say, well, um, create the created, what creation is, um, is not as it should be. Um, and our, the structures that we built in our world is not as it should be. And we all long for the coming of a new creation. Um, and so part of that, I think, is to, um, to, be, to be honest about the ways that um, we wish that progress was true, and yet it isn't. To be honest about the ways that, um, that even the technologies that we think are good are, are, harming, are harming people, that, um, that there are so many structures that we've, we've created in this thing called modernity that, that are really death dealing. And so Advent is a time to, you know, as we look towards the coming of Christ again, right, um, we know that in that, in that coming that um, all that is not holy will be judged. Um, and, and we can look around and try to name clearly or to interrogate or to, to pray that God will help us to see rightly what those things are. Yeah, thank you for that. I think that's a, a really important observation that like, because you, when you get to the lectionary readings around Advent, like a lot of judgment starts to, to build up and that makes a lot of people nervous. But, you know, there, there's something I try to kind of interrogate is yeah, our hope is in that judgment because uh, if this were just to go on and on and on uh, and if the, 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 yeah. the, the brokenness and the, and the things that in me that wound others would just go on and on and on, it would be unbearable. But the fact that these things will come under judgment is, is um, while that forces us to interrogate what's going on around is also a deeply hopeful uh, proclamation. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the, I would be, I would hate to worship a God whose only purpose is to prop up the status quo, right? And to say, oh, this is, this is all fine. I mean, I mean, look around you, right? It's not. And so, um, so obviously there are things that, that fall under judgment. And yet, at the same time, because we look forward to this eschatologically, but we also look to, to the coming of Christ in the incarnation of this one particular event at a particular time. And I think that's a really a key to Advent as well, is that it both looks, it looks in both directions, okay? It's not, it's not only a looking towards judgment. It's not only a looking towards um, the, the birth of the baby Jesus, right? Um, it's, it's both of these things. And, and in that, um, you see kind of how God's justice and God's mercy, um, God's love and God's holiness um, have to come together. Um, and as um, George Hunsinger recently said um, in, uh, in our uh, seminar on uh, volume two of the church dogmatics, there is an asymmetry in the cross, certainly, but you know, in, in Christ, um, an asymmetry that points towards mercy, right? It's not some kind of balancing act that, oh, is it gonna be justice? Is it gonna be, you know, um, God's yes, um, you know, the, the yes envelops the no, but the no still exists. Thank you for that. Uh, so, uh, just as, um, to build another question from from Colleen Rutledge, she emphasizes that Advent requires us to look evil square in the face. And we've kind of talked about that need to look around and name those things that are death dealing, name those things that are um, evil and broken in the world. But I guess like it's a, in some ways it's a tricky season to be doing this pastorally because we're going to have lots of people in our congregations where the Christmas season is where grief is felt all the more acutely because it's all about, you know, so much of the season is about, you know, family coming together and, and all this. Um, and also it's a season that people, you know, rightly want to just want to enjoy, want to enjoy their cheesy movies and their, uh, and, and the bright lights and the good food. And so I guess, how do we, you know, holding those, both those pieces together pastorally also try to engage our communities in that hard work. We look at ourselves and our, uh, the community and the world and its um, need for repair. Yeah, um, I think 
it can be possible to uh, that these things are actually pastorally helpful. And so let me say this. Um, so again, in Anglicanism, uh, traditionally the four Sundays or Advent were, were the time for preaching what they call the four last things, right? Death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Great topics, right? Um, that's absolutely <laughs> what people want to hear when they come to church, right? Um, but then now um, a lot of times people will talk about, you know, we light the Advent wreath, um, you know, the candle of hope, the candle of peace, the candle of, oh, I've gotten it wrong. Uh, what is it? Uh, yes, hope, peace, joy, and love. I, I can never, I can never remember the order. But anyway, um, you know, hope, peace, joy, and love, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Well, um, I think there are ways in which um, it's actually more pastorally honest to to hold those things together, um, I think that a kind of um, irrepressible optimism um, during Advent will say, well, you know, yes, we're leaning more towards, well, we're anticipating the baby Jesus, right? Um, we're anticipating these, these joyful things, these, you know, the coming of peace. Um, and those things are all great. Those are very necessary, those are great, those are wonderful things. And yet there are also, there are also people in our congregations that are dealing with grief, that are dealing with loss, that are dealing with the reality of death, right? That are dealing with the reality of, um, of human frailty, of human contingency, of, of sickness and fear. Uh, and I think that there are ways that these, you know, these traditional themes um, to say, you know, the second coming of Christ we hope that God will make right those things that which are not right. Um, that that can be a kind of a pastoral honesty to say, well, in this time of Advent, we, you know, I think lots of people know that suffering doesn't get put on hold. Um, and so, um, and so, I think there are a lot of different ways that churches have tried to make space for for suffering and for lament um, in the season of Advent. And you know, I wonder if um, if we tried really to preach um, to preach those texts of um, the eschatological texts, the apocalyptic texts, um, if that might go some way towards acknowledging the reality of people's lives. Because I think that if you if we put only emphasis on um, the joy of Christ's incarnation, we expect the incarnation. Um, that can kind of lay, um, add on um, to people's guilt. Say, well, why don't I? Mm. Why am I not more happy about this? Yeah. Well, you're not more happy about this because um, we live in a broken world. Mm. Right? Mm. And thank you for that. That's very helpful. Uh, so. I know that your uh, uh, Bart got mentioned in that in that last answer, and I know that you've done a lot of work with him, and and he kind of talks about uh, you know that every season for the church is is Advent, uh, and I think that he has that. And I remember back in the day when I used to uh, read more kind of like radical theology of like you know John Caputo, and that they also love the Advent. So we've got two very polar extremes on the theological spectrum there, who uh, really like Advent as this kind of almost eternal season of the church. Uh, yeah. To what extent do we, as we engage directly with Advent, you know, in, the, in, in this, you know, this one point in the calendar year, or liturgical year, also then carry this forward uh, as a posture for the church in, in, in all days? Yeah, so um, in, in one of our Eucharistic prayers, um, we say very clearly, you know, we, we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We're always in this posture between Christ is risen and Christ has ascended um, and Christ will come again. You know, one of my, honestly, um, one of my favorite um, sort of parts of the church year, of favorite doctrinal points is the doctrine of the ascension because nobody knows what to do with it, right? Because it's so strange. Yeah. Um, but I think it's helpful to think about the ascension as an eschatological doctrine, right? That as he has gone, so will he will return. And we're, we're living in this time between the going and the returning. And so, yes, um, there is always, um, we're always living in this expectation. Now, 
Um, what I would also say, though, is that we also live in the knowledge of what has happened. Like we can't go back behind um, incarnation and cross and resurrection um, as if those things had not happened. And I mean, one thing that I I think, especially with folks like um, like Moltmann, um, that I think if you make everything sheer futurity, mm. then that's that's a little bit problematic too, right? There are things that have happened in time, um, and we can't. Um, you know, we are on that, you know, between the Easter that has come and the, the, uh, the eschaton that is yet to come. Um, but it's, there are things that have happened and have affected objectively um, change in the world. Um, and so we can't put all of the emphasis on a kind of a, um, a futurity. I mean, mm. um, theology is not only hope, right? Mm. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, so let's, let's pivot the talk a bit about, we started the talk then just about the, uh, the things that have happened in history. Yeah. Christmas is also, is remembering the incarnation, the birth of Christ, uh, which leads us to talk about the role of, you know, the relationship between Christmas and Advent. Uh, so Darren Wright on Twitter, he, his uh, contribution to a question was that the idea that Christmas should come with a bang, mm -hmm. that the idea is an Advent isn't just an easing into Christmas. So I guess I'm asking, how do we, how do we hold the importance of these two things, not as separate, but also not as just conflating yeah. them, not as Advent, Advent being just uh, absorbed into Christmas, um, both in our churches and in us, our own individual lives, knowing that it's hard given that Christmas, even if you just did a shop, creeps further and further back uh, into the year. Yeah. Yeah, um, a couple of things. So um, one point that I would make is that I think in real churches, it's always very difficult to um, to do this perfectly. Um, for example, at Trinity Church, we have our wonderful Christmas pageant with our wonderful children, um, which I would never want to give up that's happening this Sunday um, at the 10 a.m. service on the fourth Sunday of Advent. Um, and so, so there's always some, some things that happen that um, where that's going to, to seep in a little bit. Um, you might have a, a church bazaar where you sell Christmas items, right? Mm -hmm. um, that, so we can never do this perfectly. I think that things that people can do in their homes um, is that, you know, it was always a big thing in my house growing up. I grew up Episcopalian. Um, you know, we had the Advent wreath um, at home and we lit it. Um, and that was kind of a big thing. We, we, we have this reminder um, that Advent, um, that Advent is a, is a real, you know, is a separate season. Um, I think that there are a lot of things that people can do to try to kind of restrain mm. um, decorating um, during Advent. Again, not everyone is going to be cool with that. I mean, some people like to put up their decorations. I know Fleming Rutledge is really, is really keen on this. I mean, she'll do no, no red and green, nothing. She'll just have maybe some greenery and some candles, right? Um, and so I know she's, she's very in, in, insistent that no, you don't decorate before, before Christmas Eve. I do think that in the church though, certainly liturgically, there's a, there's a disjuncture, right? Um, there are definitely, there are, there's a different collect, a different prayer of the day, right? That so, you know, now this has happened. Um, it's important that there's different music. Um, Advent hymns are very different than Christmas hymns. And I think we really try hard not to do, certainly at Trinity, we won't do Christmas hymns until, um, until Christmas Eve. I mean, again, except for the Christmas pageant, that's, um, th that is what it is. Yeah. But, um, you know, of having different music. Um, the thing that, the way that the bang happens for me working here at, at Trinity Church is um, at our two late services at eight in the evening and 11 in the evening. Um, we process in with runs in, once in Royal David City and then the clergy will stand in front of the crush um, and the choir will start singing. Um, it's from Bach's Christmas Oratorio you know, and there were shepherds watching in the fields by night and the angel said, fear not. And then they, you know, the choir will come in and all sing together. 
break forth, O beauteous heavenly light, light, and usher in the morning. And that's, that's kind of the moment that's the bang for me. And I think the ushers actually jack up the lights at that point, right? Break forth, O beauteous light. And that's, I think that's the kind of thing um, that, you know, liturgically that we can do. Say, yes, this is, this is an unexpected thing, right? Um, this, you know, it's, it's prophesied, it's foretold, and yet it comes to us as, you know, from outside of us, right? Mm -hmm. It is, um, it is a new and different way of our being in relationship with God. Um, so I think there are a lot of things that can be done liturgically for that. You know, again, um, I never want to add on more, more guilt to guilt. Um, uh, you know, people have uh, feel terrible about their Christmas not being what they think it should be. And I don't want to say don't make, you know, I don't want you to feel guilty because your Advent isn't what you think it should be. You know, but, um, but I think that there are, there are some things that we can do um, to not just start um, Christmas after, th so after Thanksgiving in the U.S., right? Um, you know, I saw on Twitter a, uh, someone saying, well, we, could, we should just give up Advent because the secular culture, it's the Christmas season and, you know, fine, we've, we've lost that battle. I think it's a, you know, it's something worth doing to say, no, this is, this is what the church has decided this season is going to be. It is a, it's a helpful season, I think, and certainly not to, um, it's not a time to capitulate to what um, uh, what capitalism wants us to do in this season. Mm, I think that's really helpful. Uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, on the podcast, we had Catherine Sonderegger on, and um, she was talking about, I was asking her about preaching as, as invitation and announcement rather than uh, exhortation. Yeah. Um, and I feel like Advent is, is the kind of perfect season to, to remind ourselves of this, given that, so much of all of Advent is out of our hands. Um, the, the coming again and, and the incarnation of both God acting. Uh, so I guess, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on how we can almost use Advent or how Advent, what, you know, Advent can be almost this check uh, in the way we think about how we are uh, preaching when we step into the pulpit. Yeah. Um, you know, again, uh, Fleming just did uh, the clergy conference for the Diocese of New Jersey. It was wonderful to have her with us. And at that event, she, you know, she reminded us, I think very visibly, um, that, you know, preaching should be a time when, you know, we get up in the pulpit and say, I have news. I have yeah. news to announce to you. And yes, what better time than Advent say, I have news. Mm. Christ is coming. <laughs> um, Aslan is on the move, as um, as as C.S. Lewis puts it in um, *The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe*. And that is that is an announcement, right? And this is something that um, is not about us doing things. You know, um, some advice that that she gives, and that I try to give folks as well, um, is that. You know, our sermons shouldn't end with a to-do list. They should end with a promise, right? Um, a promise that God has done things in the world, that God will continue to do things in the world. Um, and I think that's really important because it reminds us that you know, our salvation is not a thing that we're, that we're doing or that we have to then do certain things in order to be in good with God. Um, and not to say that, that our, our salvation should not issue forth in fruits, but to say that, um, what we do as Christians is not, does not pivot on a to-do list, um, even of the most well-intentioned, um, seeking after justice, um, in the world that that's not, that's not what this is about, um, in the first instance, right? And um, I, think, I think that in general, preaching certainly in mainline churches um, would be well served to focus more on what God has done and what God is doing um, than what we are doing either towards God or towards the world. Um, you know, God is, 
the subject, is the acting subject of the sentence. Um, but I think too often in our preaching, we want to make us the acting subject, us um, thinking towards God as kind of the good religious subject um, of, of liberal theology or us um, going forth in relation to our neighbors um, without having received the work of God in Christ first. And so I think it's just important to get things the right way around. Um, and I think that Advent is certainly a time for us to, to do that because our, you know, our texts are all about what God has done, mm. what God will do. Mm. Um, and not, um, and we're, we're called to be ready and that's kind of it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that's great. Uh, what does, what does the reform tradition bring to Advent? What does Advent gain from, from, from conversation with the reform tradition? Yeah. Um, well, I think, um, I did see that question on Twitter and I've been thinking about it today. Um, as I said earlier, um, I think one thing is, um, a knowledge of how, how much we see through a mirror dimly, right? Um, that, that we should always be questioning um, whether we're deceiving ourselves and praying for, for clearer sight, um, clearer scriptural sight. Um, I think that, that the Reformed tradition can also help us see um, the depths of the ways that sin pervades all that we do. Um, you know, I always, I tell people that um, when I was in, when I was in graduate school, when I was in seminary and then in my PhD program that Willie Jennings convinced me of the doctrine of total depravity by pointing towards um, the way that, that racism works in the United States, right? Um, that the, the absolute depth of sin um, and to really realize what it means for ourselves and then also for for the world around us to say that, you know, no one is righteous, no, not one. Um, and I think Advent is a particularly helpful time to remember that as, as it's a time to, to hope for clearer sight, even though we know how absolutely deeply our sight is, um, is obscured. Thank you for that. Yes, it was uh, Benjamin Williams, I think you asked that on Twitter. So I'll shout him out there, it was a great question. Something I, I've thought about occasionally, and I don't know if I have a good response, but help, perhaps you'll be able to help me, is um, so with Advent deals a lot in dark and light uh, as symbols. Uh, and that's, you know, comes out of scripture and comes out of deep liturgical language. But you, know, you brought up then the, you know, the racialized context of the US and, and, and you know, Australia has that has a highly racialized context too, a deep history of racist violence and, and prejudice, uh, which, you know, deals in darkness associated, and blackness associated with evil and light and whiteness associated yeah. with good. And I'm wondering how you have found trying to navigate that, where yeah. these are rich symbols uh, and they come from a context, particularly in the biblical language, where that connotation with skin and thing wasn't okay. um, like what it is now, but, it's, but we, we engage these symbols now. So yeah, I'm wondering how you've navigated that, or your, any thoughts you have on this? Uh... Yeah, um, I think a couple of things about this in my own practice. Um, I think that it's important to name every once in a while that that this is a way that this language has functioned um, to um, to mark some people, some places as. Um, places of damnation and other places as places of salvation, right? Um, and to map those on top of, um, of race um, and, and of geography, right? And so I think it's important to teach that, um, that the way that that's been, been used in history, you know, um, when you look at someone like like Hegel saying, well, of Africa, I have nothing to say, Africa is outside of history, right? Um, the mapping of, of darkness, of blackness onto somehow being outside of history or outside of grace, right? This is, this is a space that is devoid of God. Um, I think, so I think that's a thing to be taught because a lot of church folks just don't know that history. 
Um, I think in my own preaching, I tend not to lean on those images, okay? So I think that there are other, certainly they, they present themselves in scripture, but it's not a pivotal image in my own mm. sermons, okay? Mm. I mean, I think there are other ways to describe that that don't, um, that don't harp on that point. I mean, I would not want to see that language excised, right? I think, I think that it's a much better way to go about it than to say, hey, um, this, is, this can be problematic, um, but also that um, this, is, this is in scripture. This is not, you know, it isn't something that we have the option to, to get rid of. Um, and so let's be honest about the history of its interpretation. Um, and yet, you know, it can also be a powerful image, especially in so far as, um, you know, the ways that um, we can experience times in our own lives as times when we feel um, separate from, um, from lightness or from, from the sort of the illumination of God's presence. Um, and, you know, certainly when people talk about depression, they talk about it in terms of a kind of a darkening. Um, and I think that that's, you know, that, that, can be, that can be true in people's lives. And certainly for, um, not for you, but for those of us in the, in the Northern Hemisphere, we, um, you know, sort of the language of, um, of darkness and light can be, um, is significant for us just because of the way that the, um, the way that the day is, shorten and then lengthen yeah. around around Christmas time, right? And so mm -hmm. um so certainly those and but that's not a universal, right? Um so so it's complicated, but I think that the key is is some kind of honesty about um, how those how those how that language has functioned and how it, it can't be a universal, right? Um and and it's not um, it's not equally obvious to everyone as to what that means. Thank you for that. That's, that's really helpful. I have a final question from Facebook and then, and then okay. one last little fun question to okay. peg it off. So, um, this comes from Amelia Co. Butler. Do you want to know about, um, she was thinking about liturgical missiology. Uh, and mm -hmm. this, this question, I guess, is nice because of your, uh, your previous work with, uh, with NASA. So uh, with space science reminding us of different concepts of time and eternity, yeah. Uh, what does it mean to try to unpack the promise of heaven in the four weeks of Advent? Oh, wow. Um, you know, I think one thing that I would say is that, um, I, you know, my, um, my engagement with science is, is a bit as a, as a repentant science person. And so um, in some ways I'm very reticent to let, um, a particular scientific knowledge kind of drive the bus on doctrine, um, especially in so far as scientific knowledge keeps changing, right? Saying, oh, well, this is something that then we have to let affect the way that we think about um, the way that we think about God's act in the world. Uh, but then that might change later. I mean, look, for example, you know, Pluto was a planet and it's not a planet and then maybe it's a planet. Again, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but uh, so that's, you know, I'm always very, very reticent about, you know, sort of science as an authoritative thing, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's a lot more pliable than that. Um, what can we say about heaven and Advent? Um, <laughs> we can say that it's, it is epistemologically closed to us, right? Um, it is something that is, um, beyond any of our knowing and probably beyond any of our imagining. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so whatever it is, it is probably nothing like what we can think or imagine. Um, and actually I have, I have no problem with that because, uh, because of, this is actually a scientific thing. Um, so I did my master's degree in engineering in nonlinear dynamics and chaos theory. And we had there's a thing in nonlinear dynamics called non non integer dimensions, right? So you can have two dimensional things, you can have three dimensional things, you can have two point five six seven dimensional things. Well, how do you even think that? Um, 
you can't except that you can see little slices of it um but you can never see the thing itself um you know so you know there are things even in the physical world that are inconceivable mm -hmm. um and so um i kind of have no um no problem with with heaven also being inconceivable and just sort of leaning on the witness of scripture to say you know whatever this is um it, you know it isn't um, it isn't a thing in this world as we know the world mm, thank you for that that's that's great all right so our final goodbye question um okay. which you know i'll try to make as impossible as i can um <laughs> Is, so it's it's the new year advent right mm -hmm. the start of the new year which means yeah, we make yeah. resol which means we make resolutions yeah. uh and we're going into a new decade not only this yeah. so what would be your new church year resolution for the decade of 2020 for the 20s uh yeah. for the church what's your resolution for the church you get one to two sentences uh that what <laughs> or two to three wow. whatever you want to do whatever you want to use as little uh, as you want uh, for the resolution for the church. Uh, for uh, <laughs> there you go. I told you I'm trying to make it a lot, uh, <laughs> a lot. But I would, um, if I had to to say something, I would say um, the thing that it always has to be right. Uh, we preach Christ crucified, uh, resurrected, and coming again. And I think that if we don't keep that central, then we kind of lose sight of why we're a church, right? So, um, you know, it's foolishness to the world and yet um, it's our salvation. So that's it. And that'll preach. So um, uh, anything you want to plug as we, as we finish, anything you want to promote that get people's attention to? Um, oh gosh, you know, I, I hate, I hate this whole kind of thing, but I will say that, um, you know, sometime next year, um, I will have a book coming out with Cascade Press, The Fullness of Time um, on Jesus Christ, Science and Modernity. So um, if you're so disposed, um, be on the lookout for that. But gosh, I, you know, I'm so bad at self-promotion. So well, you're a good Twitter follow, and that's another. One. That's, <laughs> okay. If their people are following you, they'll they'll uh, hear about the book. So it's at Cara N. Slade, I think. Yep, that's um, it. And that's it. Uh, and people can look at you up at your work at Princeton, um, particularly if they want to, I guess, become a uh, Episcopal priest. Um, That's right. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, great. Liam. Thank you very much for joining us and um, have a good uh, evening. <laughs> okay, great. See you later. Bye -bye.